This morning, we're going to continue our series. And as I mentioned to you last week, uh, we're going to finish the message that I tried to finish last week, but didn't have the time to finish. No surprise. Uh, I thought I could cram it all into 30-ish minutes. And um, that's what I always think every week. And it just didn't work. And so we're going to talk about the other half of what we didn't discuss last week. If you weren't here last week, it may be one that you want to go back and listen to, but you'll certainly catch enough this morning to where it won't be a waste of time to be here. We've been in a series on the Good Samaritan, talking about what is a neighbor. Last week, we talked about how Jesus redefined being a neighbor. We discussed that the week before and how the religious leaders that uh, in Jesus' day, they felt like a neighbor was just somebody who happened to be part of their own religion, part of their own ethnic group, people who sort of made a cut by following all the rules and being exactly who these religious leaders expected them to be. It was a small subset of people Uh, in a small group of people that thought they were the centers of the earth, but really were becoming less relevant as time went on. So Jesus said, a neighbor is not just somebody who agrees with you, votes like you do, comes from the same place, um, has the same values. A neighbor is anybody who you may pass on your way. People aren't in your way, they're on your way. And so Jesus redefined neighbor. Now, last week, we sort of took a sidestep by discussing some of the issues that are really in front of us. They're, they're uh, very important, very relevant to us uh, as Christians and how we navigate the society that we find ourselves in. And I hope that you want to live biblically for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that you're not as concerned about proving to everyone around you that you're right as you are living in a way where they can see truth But we at Cap City Church, we want to hold up the word and look at the world through the word and make sure that the way we live is informed by scripture, that it's biblical uh, and something that honors Christ. And um, that's the perspective that we take every Sunday. And so I've titled the message last week, The Good Samaritan on Target and Bud Light. And uh, we had some fun talking about that. If you missed it, you might want to watch it. Uh, You might want to catch uh, some of the the main premises. I'll just tell you what they are just in case you weren't here. We discussed meat offered to idols, which is one of the, the issues in scripture that's the most consistent to things that we deal with in regards or relationship to where we choose to shop or where we choose not to shop, how we choose to spend our money in places that we choose to frequent. And so the conclusions that I made for uh, us as I taught last Sunday were really simple. The first thing is that the Apostle Paul taught us that if you choose to shop somewhere, even though that, that somewhere probably supports or could support things that we find very difficult to go along with, that it's a gray area, not the issue that we find difficult to go along with, but whether or not we choose to shop Now, I want to make that distinction very clear today. The issues are very, very real, and the Bible speaks to them. I am very aware of what's going on in our culture and our world today, as you are. It's a little bit scary and a lot concerning. And there's a lot in our world that is not gray. It's black and white. And in the black and white issues, we as Christians have to stand for truth in love, having a conversation with the world around us, not an argument. But the Apostle Paul said that if you choose to shop, you choose to eat meat offered to idols, you can choose to do that. It is a gray area and it's your prerogative. If you choose not to shop because your conscience won't allow you, that's also a gray area and it's your prerogative. Now we have to be mindful of Christians who are new Christians who may fall into sin based on freedoms that you and I choose in our own life that would be consistent with said shopping or not shopping or eating meat to idols or not eating meat, but that in general, it's a great issue, a great area, and you can choose. Now, I want to repeat the things that may make you want to shop somewhere, the root issues, the moral issues, the biblical issues. They're not gray. They're black and white. But whether we choose to shop, that is gray and you can choose. So shop if you want to shop. Don't shop if you don't want to shop. And then here's the kicker. And this is what kicked most of us, you and me, um, in the the hind quarters is according to Romans 14, whatever we decide, don't compromise our ability to be about the gospel. So keep our opinions to ourselves in the gray areas or the gray issues. 
I've had so many conversations with people over the last week or so. Our kids are going to be singing in just a minute for Father's Day, and so that's why they're in here. But so many great conversations with people this last week who say, I just can't keep my opinions to myself. And my gentle and loving response is, my opinion's not worth a whole lot, so yours may not be worth a whole lot either. Why do you feel the need to traffic your opinion on everybody who will listen? And the other side to that is, Sometimes I feel compelled just to collect opinions from people, just for the sake of voyeurism. I just want to know what you think so that I can put you in a category, so that I can figure out who you may vote for or where you come from, what your values are. And we don't have a responsibility as Christians to collect opinions, nor do we have a responsibility or obligation to give out our opinions on the gray areas. The other areas are areas where we have to selectively, carefully, strategically be an articulate voice speaking out for Jesus in a confusing marketplace of ideas and shouting and lobbying and boycotting is not the way. Now, we live in a democracy. This is all review, you loving that? We live in a democracy. Jesus didn't live in a democracy. Did you know that? Neither did Paul. Jesus didn't fight a culture war and he lost in all respects, looking at his life, influencing the government around him or changing the political structure of the landscape. The apostle Paul lost when it came to politics, but they weren't living their lives for the purpose of politic. They were living their lives for the purpose of the gospel which they fundamentally believed would change the culture in the world as one person embraced Jesus and then passed it to another and passed it to another. And then society begins to change, which it did over time. And you and I are here because of it, but we live in a democracy. So we get to vote our conscience. I think that a lot of times we're a little too vocal about who and why we choose to vote. And as we'll talk about in a minute, If it doesn't give you a little heartburn, you're not paying attention. But I feel like that it's our obligation to vote. And it's our obligation as Christians to be informed. And there are two black and white issues that inform the way that I vote. One is the fact that I believe that life begins at conception. And number two is I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman in a permanent covenant relationship before God, monogamous, honoring the Lord, living out the picture of Jesus in the church. Those two issues are the issues that inform the way that I vote. Those two issues sometimes inform the way that I shop, but they don't have to. That is a gray area. So we choose. Now, how does a Christian live in a world that competes for our thoughts, our attention, that competes for our influence? I reminded you last week and I'll remind you again that we can't use the devil's tools and fight the way the devil fights to say that we're trying to honor the Lord. So today we're gonna follow up on that. I'm gonna apply it. I'm gonna try to land the plane and hopefully we'll at least have clarity even if we don't have unity. And um, I'm not gonna boycott you if you don't agree with me. So please don't boycott me. But let's talk about how we can best speak out for Christ in a world that oftentimes doesn't wanna listen. So a few days ago, Joy and I were at the Home Depot and um, not my favorite place to go, but uh, certainly not my wife's favorite place to go, but she went. We were going to pick up some stuff and um, for a project we were working on. And I was getting out of the truck slowly, was trying to find my wallet. And um, Joy got out a little faster than me and I had my door open, but um, I wasn't out of the truck yet. And so Joy hops out of the truck first and she's just ready to go. And and I hear um, something before I see something. I hear somebody say, hey, come over here. I've got something cute to show you. And I was automatically in stage two of alertness and wondering what in the world's going on at the Home Depot. And um, and I look over and, and Joy is trotting over to this car and this guy goes, hey, I got a puppy and his window's down. And he's like pointing and Joy's going to the car. Now, what in the name of Jeffrey Dahmer, John Wayne Gacy? That's the way every single dateline starts. 
And I yelled and said, Joy, no. I mean, I yelled, I literally yelled. I said, do, do not go to the car. You'll hear, and the guy pull her in and off she goes and the cops will blame me. Um, I couldn't believe she was doing it. Danger, horrified. And there goes Joy. And, and I get sometimes we see danger and we get horrified and we don't know what to do. And we just yell, don't go over there. We freak out and it's natural. It's human. When we look at the world around us, sometimes we see the danger and it's real. We're horrified. We yell, don't go over there because we, we don't know what else to do. And, and we can't lose our vigilance. We can't lose our sense. We can't lose our purpose, but we can be strategic and we can be careful. In Romans 14, the apostle Paul says that there are matters of conscience that are gray areas. And in the gray areas, for the sake of the gospel, Make sure that you keep your convictions between you and God. Because if you choose to share your convictions in the gray areas with people who don't genuinely need to know them, you're doing a couple of things. One, you are eliminating the possibility of you changing your mind because you and I are just too proud. Once we've told everybody, we're not going back. Number two, we have put ourselves in a spot by choosing to tell everybody our opinions, where we're potentially causing them issues of sin that they never had in the first place because these are gray areas and yet we've imposed a conundrum on them, a problem. And number three, when we impose our convictions in the gray areas on people, it makes us, it forces us to live a life of absolute consistency because if we're not consistent, we're hypocrites. What is the biggest criticism of the church today and the world around us? Well, the church is full of a bunch of hypocrites and it's true, we are hypocritical. Everyone's a hypocrite. I had a doctor friend for a long time who loved donuts and um, he looked like it. And I'm like, dude, you're the, telling everybody how to be healthy. You know, you're talking to me about my blood pressure. And he's like, well, I just know what to do. I don't actually, you know, do it. And well, at least we're honest about it, right? I mean, um, you know, he wasn't super consistent in, in, you know, his application of what he knew to be true. But, you know, I mean, I gave him the benefit of the doubt. He'd been to med school and, you know, knew the prescriptions to write and he was my friend. But you and I, um, when we say this is what Jesus believes, this is what a Christian does, this is how we're supposed to live, we have to be absolutely consistent. Hypocrisy is saying that we are convicted or believe something morally that we in turn don't do with our actions, that our actions don't line up with our convictions. And if we say, you know, I'm gonna boycott one place because it violates my sensibilities, my sense of morality, um, and we tell people about it, then you bring yourself into the line of questioning, rightfully so, well, if you're gonna violate this company, why not that company? And if you're gonna violate that company, then why not the other? And at the end of the day, it boils down to a matter of convenience. And we say, well, I don't really need to shop at Target because Walmart's right across the street, but there's no chance I'm putting my iPhone up because I'm never gonna be an Android person. And we look at what it costs us personally to situationally apply our moral ethics. And our inconsistency is clear to the people who are paying attention and our words fall flat. What company is there that we can wholeheartedly support that lives according to biblical principles and applies them consistently in every aspect of their corporate life? And how much work would it take for you to evaluate the corporate charters and personal lives of every single person involved in commerce and industry in the United States? You can't do it. I mean, for goodness sake, I'd have to give up my Nikes. I'd have to throw my iPhone away. I'd have to drive my Ford truck into the lake. I couldn't use Procter & Gamble. I'd have to close my Chase accounts. I mean, I couldn't even shop at Hy-Vee, for goodness sake. And you begin to look at all the places. Joy and I played this game the other day and going, if we're gonna be consistent, where can we shop? And you know what? We couldn't find any place. I couldn't even go to downtown Des Moines for the love of goodness. I mean, I, I, because you know, they're, they're supporting things that violate my sensibilities. And um, the only way I could be consistent is if I made my own clothes, rode in a buggy, pulled by a horse, lived in Missouri and made people drive around me on the highway. The apostle Paul says, 1 Corinthians 5, you judge the church, God judges the world. Don't expect the world to have convictions like the church because the Holy Spirit is not in them. 
So we have to be consistent. Now, if you don't choose to share your convictions, you can be as inconsistent as you want to be because you can vote with your dollars as your conscience allows. And you don't bring yourself under scrutiny. Choose to shop, choose not to shop. And nobody criticizes because nobody knows. You tracking with me? Not are you agreeing with me, but are you tracking with me? But when I tell you this is where you should shop, then you get to ask me all those uncomfortable questions that I don't want to answer. I have to be consistent with where I shop. I have to be consistent with my politics. And um, this gives me a whole lot more heartburn than where I shop. Because as I mentioned to you, there are really two issues that inform how I vote. The sanctity of human life and what I believe the Bible defines marriage as being. And I find myself having to walk around unspeakable things in people's lives to get to the two issues that I want to support that for me are much more difficult than walking around sections in a store that might offend my sensibilities. But yet sometimes Christians elevate these politicians to deity status and the world around us pays attention and they're watching. And in many cases, you wouldn't trust them with your paycheck or your wife for more than 30 seconds. So we have to be careful and consistent, voting our conscience, but careful how we share our opinions. Number three, where we work. Erastus, one of Paul's friends, was a missionary that Paul left eventually in Corinth. And um, he used to travel with Paul. And um, Paul was a good friend of Erastus. They were buddies and all, by all accounts and purposes. They were acquainted. They greeted each other. They they knew each other. Erastus was left in Corinth, and Erastus ultimately became the Adele of Corinth. Now, the Adele, I asked somebody earlier if they knew what Adele was, and they said, yeah, Adele's a great singer. And I'm like, no, not that Adele. Um, Adele is, uh, was, was like a city manager. They were in charge of all of the commerce. They were in charge of the worship, both idol worship, which was demonic, and church worship, which wasn't, with the theater district, with the commerce in the city, I mean, they were in charge of everything. And Erastus, a Christian, a friend of Paul's, became the Adele of the city of Corinth, which was one of the most corrupt cities in the entire, well, anywhere that Jesus and Paul ever frequented, for sure. Jesus didn't frequent there. And we see throughout scripture that, that Erastus stayed there in relationship to Paul. Church history tells us as part of the church in Corinth and supervised idol worship, Christian worship, the theater district, which had all kinds of unspeakable, unseemly, unsavory, anti-Christian themes. Who was able to move into the city, who had to move out of the city, commerce, everything else. Many people have asked me this last week, they work for a company that is supporting non-biblical things, so I need to quit. And I said, you can quit if you wanna quit, if you feel like your conscience is being violated to the point where you lose your witness or you're tempted to sin, but you don't have to quit. You can choose to or choose not to. And Erastus was somebody who chose not to, even though friends, every sensibility that he had would have been violated by being part of the city of Corinth and in charge. He worked his entire career there. And about two years ago, archeologists uncovered a stone in the theater district and the stone was called the Erastus Stone. They had paved their streets, didn't have enough money, Corinth, to pave their entire infrastructure. And so Erastus donated money that historians tell us would have been the equivalent of hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars to finish paving the streets in the theater district, the no-no district. And there was a plaque that Erastus left, a stone that had an inscription that was carved into marble and uh, inlaid with bronze. And it said, thank you for allowing me to serve you as your Adele, as your manager. And then simply was signed Erastus. Now church historians tell us that Erastus influenced Corinth and that many people came to Christ and joined the church through people who chose not to walk away. Being a separatist was not the only way to be being a professional objectioner, boycotter, picketer was not the only way to be. And Erastus was a biblical example that sometimes it really is possible to be in the world, but not of it. Now, 
there are exceptions to the rule. And um, the Apostle Paul also talks about a time where we have people who may try to make you complicit in their activities and to sign on uh, to the agenda of the world. He says, if you're invited over to someone's home and they say, hey, this meat was offered to idols. If you eat this, you're going to be part of it. Um, Paul says, don't do it. You can't do it. You have to put your foot down and say no. That we as Christians, we can't partake. We can't become part of. I use an iPhone. Like I said, won't use an Android. Don't know anything about Androids. Don't want to know. I use an iPhone. Apple's a company that could be found objectionable should you choose to dig deep enough, as is every other company, except maybe Chick-fil-A. And I asked Pastor Jared, I said, in the terms and conditions of the iPhone, Jared, I've never read them, but Jared's memorized them. I said, I check them at the end of my activation or upgrades. Does it say that I have to sign my life over to Satan or to agree with an agenda or political structure that I don't want to agree with? He said, nope. And I said, okay, I can still use my iPhone. It's a matter of conscience. At some point, we won't be afforded the gray areas anymore. So the exception to the rule would be when somebody lets you know that they are expecting you to be part of this anti-Christian, anti-biblical cultural movement. And at that point, we have to step back and say no. But yet we also know that one day is coming when we won't have a choice. In the book of Revelation, maybe you don't spend much time in Revelation. It's a hard book to figure out. In the book of Revelation, we read that a time is coming when we're gonna be forced to agree with the policies and the agendas of this world. And the mark of the beast will be imposed on all of us and those of us who refuse to worship will be killed. It'll be forced on all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or their foreheads so that they could not what? Buy or sell. So that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. A time is coming, maybe not my lifetime, and maybe not yours, where we will not be afforded the gray areas. And we have to stand up and it costs us our lives. But my question is not, what do we do then? Because it's clear. My question is, what do you do now? Our words carry weight. It's extremely important for us when we speak out to realize that we're speaking on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ, because those of us who say we're Christians, we no longer lose our, our right to just speak as an American, as a citizen of Ankeny or Sailorville or Des Moines or Altoona or Waukee or Ames, that our words carry weight and that you, if you're not a believer, you can say whatever you want. You can boycott whatever you want. You can mix it up. You don't really have a witness per se to be concerned about. And so your words, they may carry a little bit of weight, but they don't carry a lot of weight. But for those of us who say that we're followers of Jesus Christ, our words, they reflect on him. And James says, whenever we put ourselves in the position of being a moral authority or a teacher, that not only will people judge Jesus by what we say, but that we'll be judged by what we say as well. And that our words carry more weight but yet we're often careless with those same words. I was thinking about Jesus and a woman caught in adultery. Remember that story? One of my favorite stories in all the Bible, not because I'm pro-adultery, I'm not. Um, I'm pro-Jesus. And there was a woman who was caught in adultery. Was she wrong? Yup. Um, guilty of sin deserving of death. She was a threat to the Christian way of life. She was a home wrecker potentially. She might steal our children, our sons, maybe ruin your, your marriage. Scandalous. And church religious leaders drug her in and said, we're going to kill her. We're going to support our way of life. We're going to enforce our morality. And you know what? Adultery is a sin, no way around it. And she was guilty. 
And she was in trouble. And it seems like the only people that Jesus ever even considered boycotting were the hyper-religious people who kept saying they spoke for him, but they didn't. And Jesus walked over to the woman who was caught in adultery and he sat down with her. And he wrote something in the dirt and we don't know what he wrote because it's not our business. It was between Jesus and her. And he looked at the men and he said, any of you don't have any sin, throw the first stone. And um, the Bible says that they begin dropping their rocks, the oldest first, beginning and then ending with the youngest. And some people stop that, the story there, and they're, they're done with it. And then Jesus looked at the woman. He said, who's left here to condemn you? She says, no one. And some people stop the story there and they say, see, that's what we're supposed to be as Christians. Non-condemning, yes, but that doesn't mean tolerant without morality and participating in the sins that are black and white and prohibited by scripture. It means being for people and separating them from the sin that they may have in their life. And by the way, remembering that you and I have sin in our lives as well, Jesus didn't. And he said to her, is there anybody here left to condemn you? She said, no, there's not, but we don't end there because it's not all about inclusion and tolerance. It's about love and accepting a person, but standing for principle. And the next thing Jesus says is, neither do I condemn you. And some people stop there and don't read the rest of the story. And they say, you see that? The church didn't condemn her and Jesus didn't condemn her. So everybody can just hold hands and go do whatever they want. And Jesus knew the woman was walking toward the car and the person had just said, hey, come over here. I want to show you something cute. And he was, no, don't go. You can't go over there. In the name of Jeffrey Dahmer and John Wayne Gacy, danger. But he did it in a Jesus way, not in a religious way. He didn't have rocks. He had compassion. And he sat with her and put himself in a place where he would take the shots if they threw the rocks. He protected her from the church. Is there anyone to condemn you? No, I don't condemn you either. And then he said, with his arm around her, I'm sure, and a smile on his face, there's a different way to live. But do you see how he did it? Because he was with her. He had leveled the ground at the foot of the cross. He wasn't scandalized. He wasn't a separatist. He loved her. Micah 6, 8 tells us something very important. This is how we'll conclude. Oh, people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of us while we wait to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. If my theology makes me bitter, ungenerous, judgmental, and critical, then it has filled my head with religion and my heart is absence of Christ, absent of Christ. So let's be careful how we live. In the gray areas, you can choose. Choose to shop, choose not to shop. But in the gray areas, keep your convictions to yourself for the sake of the gospel. Father, thank you for my friends. And I pray that as we finish the time this morning, that you would speak to us, that this truth would land. It's a difficult message because there's just so much of us that we just want to be our own cultural warriors. We want to, to pick up the sword and, and go to war for you. And, to think we're doing your work and things like boycotts and, and being a part of mailing lists and getting the word out seems so religious and so spiritual. And I'm just so reminded that we can't fight like the devil and say we're doing it to please you, to please the Lord. So I pray, Father, that we would be people who would level the ground at the foot of the cross, full of compassion, living a life known 
for its love. Not condemning people. But loving them. Separating them from the sin. Seeing them as valuable, perhaps wounded and often misunderstood. Shielding them from the church if necessary. So that we can encourage and nudge and be part of challenging our friends to live a different way. That's the only thing that's going to fix this world, Father. One life at a time, the gospel passed from one person to another. So let us do our part to walk with humility and mercy. In Jesus' name.